And I will introduce my good friend, Julian Lindry French, who is going to moderate the speech between the two. Julian is the chair of the Alfin Group, among an many other affiliations, a group that I happen to be a part of, and Ben as well, a strategic uh, analyst group. Please. Thank you very much, Kate. The two and guys are yours. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> They're in safe hands, at least for a moment. Uh, good morning, everybody. Great pleasure to, to, to be here. And, and thank you, gentlemen, for leading us into this, this panel. I'm not going to beat around the bushes. We've got 10 minutes for a, a, a debate. You know, the thing that's annoying me most about the discourse in Europe right now is that we're so surprised by what Russia has done. Um, read the stuff I've been writing over years, predicting it. Putin told us he would do this. He's been trying to build, as it turns out rather badly, a force to do what he has done. So. I want to start off with asking a fairly blunt question, and it's really one that I'm speaking to our political colleagues as well as yourselves. Um, are we up to this? Are we up to the challenge that Putin has laid down? Not just Putin, China, uh, given the pressures on the United States. Or are we still drifting in this hope that we can go back to this nice, cozy status quo ante world? Because if we don't grip it politically, I don't see how we can prepare militarily for what lies ahead. General. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, of course, a very good question. Uh, but uh, I, I have to remind myself that um, I went to the US Army War College back in 2014-15 when the invasion of uh, Crimea and, and eastern Ukraine happened. And, and I remember the professor there drew the map and he said, what's the next goal? And the, the goal looked exactly the same as we see today. It was. It was uh, the control of the whole Donbas region. It was the land bridge between uh, Donbas and, uh, and Crimea. And then it was, of course, holding Crimea. So, um, so uh, very surprised. Um, I think we were surprised that they actually would do this. After all the diplomacy, after all the, the sharing of intelligence, uh, on the, and also on the status of their forces, I think uh, if Putin had known, he would have, think, have thought twice. But I agree with you. He has done what he has said. So it shouldn't be a surprise. But uh, do we go back to an optimistic um, world where we all try to live in peace? I hope so. Mm. That's really what I hope for. Uh, and I, I agree also with what Ben said um, about the situation in Ukraine. And what worries me now is, is that um, it seems the Russians are starting to actually dig in themselves. So will we now have a static trench war going on? And we knew how, from, from European history, we saw what happened in 1914. And it was time for political leaders to sit down and talk through this and find a solution. But they continued until 1918 in the trenches and lost 20 million plus people. I don't know how many, but, but uh, all these people died for nothing. And I think that's something we will see, I don't know, in Ukraine, but I, I, th I think that's a possible outcome, that they will actually dig in now, and it will be very static. Um, and uh, Russia has the capability to still to, to sort of um, use more force, but um, so does Ukraine. So I think we are seeing a very static war now. Ben, um, China is emerging as the most formidable adversary of the US in the Indo-Pacific, increasingly globally. For all its incompetence, Russia is still the most formidable opponent of the US in Europe. Uh, it strikes me that given the development of the Chinese military, Europeans are going to have to become by 2030 a very formidable opponent of Russia simply to make the alliance work. Do you think we Europeans are up to it? You've talked about self-deterrence. Are we up to that, this challenge that has been laid down to us? Well, first of all, the, uh, the United States has got to, uh, we've been reminded that we have just as many strategic interests in Europe as we do in the Pacific. Uh, th this notion that somehow this uh, unfortunate choice of words pivoting to the Pacific caused people, including in the U.S., to think that we no longer were going to worry about Europe. Europe, take care of yourself, which is a ridiculous notion because our prosperity 
is directly tied to European prosperity. And European prosperity depends on European security and stability. So it's in our interest to stay involved as much as possible uh, to ensure that stability and security, number one. Number two, all of our best and most reliable allies come from Europe, as well as uh, Canada and Australia. So uh, I, don't, I, I think we've been reminded of the importance here. I think we're going to see increased American presence uh, in Europe, permanent basing along the uh, Eastern Front, Poland, Romania, Baltic countries. Uh, not back to Cold War numbers, that's not necessary, but certainly um, uh, more than what we had just a couple of years ago. Um, deterrence is about speed. I mentioned speed of recognition earlier. Uh, it's also speed of decision. And this is where um, even now we still have European allies, really smart, intelligent people that are like, oh, you know, we need to hurry up and get to a settlement that are still not willing to do what's necessary to crush um, the, the one who would seek to crush everything that we care about. And so, um, time for some realism. Um, easy for me as an old retired soldier to say, a little bit more difficult for the political leaders that bear the responsibility. But that's what we need in our democratic societies, civilian leaders that can withstand all the pressure and can speak clearly to their populations. And my sense is that if a civilian leader trusts his or her own population, and speaks clearly to them, 70% will say, God damn it, okay. I mean, they'll do it. There, and there'll always be a part that won't do it. But that's, that's what's called for, is not just newer tanks, um, but also clear leadership from our civilian authorities. I think that's the key word of this conference, leadership. And now is a time for leadership. General, the next 10 years could well see the equivalent of 70 past years of technology entering the battle space, revolutionizing technology, even to maintain interoperability at the high end with US forces will be a challenge. What is Norway's vision for its future force by 2030 that includes artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, cyber warfare, a whole gamut of the future war which Ben and I wrote about recently in a, in a, in a new book? So uh, what, what, what's the vision? Uh, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give a holistic military advice next summer on the future of, the, of our forces. Um, the problem we all are struggling with, I'm answering slightly different than what you asked for, mm -hmm. is, uh, is how, when do you make the decision to move from what we could call industrial aged platforms to modern technology? So when do you move from tanks to something autonomous to something else? When you move from, uh, from frigates to another surface vessel that is maybe more in volume and, and, has more, um, and is cheaper. Um, so when do you move from these platforms into the new technology, when the new te technology is still not mature enough? Mm. And that's, the problem. that's one problem we are struggling with. The other, the other problem is, is that uh, technology always promises too much in the short term. But in the long term, we don't see the consequences of technology. So we don't, we don't understand what it really can bring to the table. And it's, so we're sort of um, undercalculating in the long term, and we are maybe promising too much in the short term. Uh, and the last thing that really worries me now is, because every nation in Europe, I think to include the US and, and other partners around the world, we are all spending more money on defense. So Norway has increased its defense spending ever since, um, yes, for many, many years. But what, what happens now when everybody is spending more money on defense? The demand for equipment, for ammunition, for spare parts, like Ben Hodges uh, talked about, is huge. And is industry stepping up their production rate? We know what, what turned the tide in World War II was the, the, the American industry you know, supporting the, the war effort. That was, that, that's really what turned the tide. But, but I, I think we are in a risk now to spend more money, but actually because the prices are rising, due to the pandemic, due to the war in Ukraine, due to the demand, we might not get more defense out of the money we actually are spending. So that's, that's something that really worries me. So the industry needs to step up now. And it takes political initiatives so they can actually take the risk. Well, gentlemen, uh, our time is up. 
I hope the politicians in the room who are about to talk next uh, after this panel are listening, um, because this is a historic time, uh, as you said, General, and uh, the challenge for them will be profound in the years ahead. Kate, I hand the floor back to you. Thank you, General. No, you're it's the not. one introducing the guest. Yes, that's what it says here. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, very short but interesting conversation. I know that the general will have to leave us. That's why we made it this way. So thank you very much, Christofferson. Okay. You are relieved. <laughs> Give him a big hand. <laughs> then I will ask uh, Ben and Julian to stay, and I will ask uh, our three uh, other speakers to this session, Odin Johannesson, uh, to come up to the stage, Sofia Nyström and Christine van Bruskoy. Udin, you know, maybe as um, we want you to sit here, Udin. I am talk to the uh, producer. Oh, you so talk to the producer. Okay, making uh, okay confusing me then. Okay, uh, Udin is uh, he was the chief of our army some years ago, but is now working uh, in the Norwegian Business and Industry Security Council. We are looking forward to listen to you. Uh, Sofia Nyström is the chief of our national security uh, authority, sitting there, and Christina Van um, um, Bruskor is postdoctoral fellow at the University of Oslo. Welcome. You confused me, Odin. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but you know, coming from Bergen and sitting and talking, I can't do that. No. I need to stand up. That is. Uh, <laughs> Basically, how it is. So okay. I'm sorry for that, Kate. You understand what Norway, with its uh, long geography and western coast, has to deal with this Bergen source. <laughs> okay. The word is yours. Udin, you have seven minutes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kate, for inviting me here to share some perspectives on hybrid warfare as we see it from the Norwegian Security Council. Wars happens. Because somebody believes they can win. Margaret Atwood wrote in, in 1995, and basically it's still to the same today. We have, in a way, thought that war will not happen because somebody don't think they can ever win, but we were wrong. So we shouldn't be that surprised, in my opinion. Hybrid warfare has been on the radar since approximately 20. 2008, or maybe longer, but uh, at least uh, from that uh, time, people started to write extensively, or more extensively, about it. Uh, we have heard a lot about it, but seen very little evidence, with a few exceptions. And I will um, argue uh, that the term is quite hard for many to visualize and to conceptualize. So I'll try to give some examples. Uh, it's not new. It happens worldwide. It happens in the United States of America, as we see here. Who would actually believe that the US East Coast would run out of fuel? Not me, for a second. It happens during elections in the United States of America and in Norway. It is about buying and selling things legally, and I have to stress legally. And we believe in capitalism. Capitalism is why we are so fine here today, why we have the welfare society, nothing else but capitalism, trade and trade. And this is, this is what is actually at stakes when it comes to hybrid threats. It's about communications. Who would actually see a world functioning if you cannot communicate? Everything will stop. And it's also about oil and gas pipelines, as we see here. This is outside the west coast of Norway. And if you then take this map and put that on top of it, you can basically see what they have been doing. This is a Russian 
seismological vessel operating for a Norwegian Oscar-based company, uh, doing legal seismological survey in the North Sea Basin last summer. On top of that infrastructure you saw on the, the previous picture. This is what the newspapers wrote about it. This is about coin on, on crypto, making crypto coins or crypto mining during Trident Juncture in Alvdal, a very famous crypto mining community in Norway, uh, not so much, but the Russians put up uh, facilities there. And this is also legal. Norwegian lawyers helping Russian business and industry into the Norwegian markets. It's legal. It's democratic. It is what we believe in. And even though, just to point from the last week's news or media outlet, this is what happens outside Molde, uh, with uh, civilian vessels doing civilian things, uh, but maybe not so much. <clears throat> we have a trawler that passed the internet cable to Svalbard more than 30 times, but this is what the police made out of it. They had no reason to believe that it was actually we had no evidence for something uh, criminal had actually uh, taken place. Well, well, this is what connects us to America, basically. And so it's been for years, for decades. It started with copper and now it's fiber. And it's still there. And for those of you who believe that uh, internet is in the air, it's actually not. It is on the bottom of the sea, basically. Hybrid warfare is, in our opinion, about utilizing the tools and freedoms of liberal democracies for clandestine and hostile purposes. It is about using time, technology, economy, sociology, uh, psychology, commerce, trade, freedom of speech, navigation, movement of money and labor uh, to a purpose that is not supporting democratic values. It can be disinformation campaigns, but it can be a lot of other things as well. To discover hybrid warfare is complicated, and to fight it is even more complicated, because it requires us to actually fight the democratic values we believe in. To close down freedom of speech, to close down freedom of trade in order to get control, so by fighting hybrid warfare, we actually run the risk of destroying our own democracy from within side. So it, in our opinion, it requires new ways of dealing with both the private sector and the government sector, a way where military terms like supported and supporting need to have another minute, meaning. Finally, it requires a new way of leading, and leadership has already been, been stated here. The basis is a cross-sector, cross-domain situation picture to get all on the same sheet of music. Then a cross-sector authority to coordinate and prioritize what is required to actually try to fight the hybrid. To fight hybrid war is more about handling the risk, accepting the risk, handling it, and, about, uh, and less about using power as we normally uh, see it in the military term. It is about sharing information, coordinating effects. And I would like to finish off with an African proverb, because this is the only way we can fight hybrid. That is together. It says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. We need to go together at all levels if we should succeed in defending against hybrid threats today, tomorrow, and in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Odin. Thank you very much indeed, sir. <laughs> Going far together. Sophie, please. Going far together is the backbone of our policy for the services in Norway. 
And what we're talking about is cyber operations, navigational warfare, satellite warfare, information operations, influence operations, the whole specter of attacks. 237 cyber operations have been conducted towards Ukraine infrastructure, government services, finance, and, and uh, critical national infrastructure since the invasion 24th of February. 40 of these have been uh, sabotage and destructive of nature. And this is something that doesn't reach the newspapers necessarily. It's invisible. It's the virtual world is very difficult to communicate in the mix of conventional warfare. This is the name of our game. We need to fight this hybrid threat, and we need to do it together. That's the only way to combat this, and across sectorials, across boundaries, across the Atlantic. A recent study published pinpoints that 80% of almost, thir uh, almost 1,000 energy professionals globally are concerned of operational breakdowns the next two years in the power supplies. 80% thinks this will happen for critical national infrastructures, the ones running our power, power grids. We're all relying on these infrastructures, military, logistics, hospitals, and they also think that almost 50% of them think that we have loss of life in the next few years, cost of cyber operations towards our power, power, uh, power banks. These are stunning numbers for once actually looking at the risk of our critical national infrastructures every day. And this is something we need to live with. We need to prioritize some of the most vulnerable assets in our global economy, our global military structures, in order to be robust. We need to prepare, and it's now. And we need leadership, and speed of leadership, that will actually pinpoint how we can make our societies more robust against hybrid warfare. We see Russia combining all techniques. They are, they're good at this. We need to combat this with countermeasures across these uh, divisional lines. Yesterday, Nortura, the Norwegians in, in, in the conference know, know this company. Nortura uh, is specializing on meat, meat supply to the Norwegian society. They went out and said the ransomware attack we had before Christmas, they attributed to Russia. A similar attack was towards uh, the meat supply in, in the U.S. Is a criminal act? Is a state act? This is, this is the space we are, as a national security authority, dealing with every day. Is it state-sponsored? Is it criminal? We don't know. Last week, we saw a tweet from an anonymous group in Italy. The next, next target of the kill nets is Norway, it says. The targets will be Norway. This is a posted on uh, the 19th of May, along with the fake photo of NATO's Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. Is it a legitimate threat? Should we take a, a con great concern over this? Possibly. They are looking at targeting Norway with the distributed denial of service, taking down services in the Norwegian infrastructure. Denmark just raised their threat level last week for hybrid threats. What is, what is important now is to act on these pieces of both intelligence and, and threat, both on social medias and in more subtle foras. And we do that every day to be able to counter it, to be able to be better, better prepared, to be able to, to fight this hybrid space. What is unique at the Ukraine situation is also the hacktivism, mm. or activism. We've seen a monumental shift in how technical skilled people around the world have been on both sides fighting for Ukraine or the Russian side to, to, to combat this from a civilian point of view. This has never happened before. 
pro-Russian, and also the other side. We also see a destructive ransomware sabotaging the railway in Belarusia in February, trying to slow down the movement of troops towards the border of Ukraine. Never happened before. So the mix of criminals, hacktivism, state-sponsored, and influence operations now is making this virtual world extremely complex. And I will just reiterate that the only way that we can combat this is to share information and do these discussions on what is the, what is the most effective countermeasures and the policies we need in order to address these, these questions. And I just want to quote Avril Haines, U.S. Um, Director of National Intelligence, who recently said that the only way to look at this is to see the intersect between all these fragments of information and operations. The intersect. One minute, please, uh, Sophie. And this intersection is a, is a major, major uh, issue for us, to see these fragments together across the boundaries in order to see the full picture on how to combat and retaliate if we, we need to uh, together. And we also see from a Nor Norwegian perspective that fragments from one operations is used on the next operations and the next operations over years and years. The ones that think that one cyber operation or influence operation is contained, this is history. It's information over many, many years that give our advisories the information they need in order to be prepared for, for hybrid warfare. So sharing is the backbone, and countermeasures will be the policy, and the speed and the leadership around these topics will be extremely important in the, in the phase going forward now. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie, and thank you for being spot on time. It's great. <laughs> Christine. Thank you very much. Uh, what I'm going to try to do in my few minutes available seven is minutes. seven minutes <laughs> is to square the circle between the conventional military threat that we may be facing from Russia and these hybrid threats. And I'll make three key points. The first one is that I don't think what we're seeing in Ukraine illustrates the threat, the military threat we face from Russia. The Russian operation in Ukraine was prescribed and designed within significant political and military constraints. And I don't think we should conclude that what we're seeing in Ukraine is the maximum capacity and effort of the Russian military. The Russian military has been designed and set up to fight at wartime strength against an adversary like NATO. This is what they've trained and exercised for. And the types of modern military operations that Russia aspires to are calibrated against an adversary like NATO. It might well be that Russian forces would do no better than they're doing at the moment against NATO. Russian intelligence assessments have been deeply flawed. The operation in Ukraine has revealed the limitations of an authoritarian decision-making model. But it would be a mistake, I think, to believe that the war, a war between Russia and NATO would look in any way like what we've seen in Ukraine. And it would be a mistake to assume that the flawed assessments would look the same in a confrontation with NATO. In conventional terms, I think the military threat NATO may face from Russia in the next 10 to 20 years could look quite different from what we've seen at display in Ukraine. I'm not saying the Russians are not taking a toll in Ukraine, of course they are, but I would expect that Russia will seek to re-establish a conventional military force and re-establish some capacity for waging war against NATO. From Russia's perspective, the potential for that conflict is growing, and we should expect an intensified Russian effort to prepare for it, even if we know that their capacity for such preparation is diminishing at the moment. My second argument is that Russia would still use hybrid tactics in a war with NATO, even if we haven't seen these tactics at significant display in Ukraine. The Ukrainian ambassador talked yesterday about how it's only in the West that there exists such a thing as a post-Crimea. And if we were watching closely, we would have seen that Russia has been using the full range of state capabilities since 2014 against Ukraine to try and exert maximum pressure on that state. 
The war we're seeing now is the culmination of that effort and the result of a failing strategy of hybrid warfare. That strategy did not deliver the desired outcome, and Russia then reached for conventional military force in order to achieve its objectives. So it's not to say that now we need to focus on conventional forces only. We need to pay attention to this full range of capabilities that Russia makes use of to get what it wants. Russian military strategists talk about how an adversary's center of gravity is its political willingness to sustain the fight. It comprises political and military leaders and the population's willingness to stay in that fight. That center of gravity can be targeted with both military and non-military means. And this is one of the reasons that Russia has developed a sophisticated concept for information confrontation, one that includes cyber operations, subversion, influence operations, and electronic warfare. Such capabilities can effectively target, according to Russian strategists at least, the willingness to fight by, for example, dislodging military operations, by deceiving popular will, by depriving the population of critical services. The greater the level of confrontation, the more significant the pressure and the broader use of capabilities to exert that type of pressure. Russian strategists furthermore point out that the more technologically advanced a society is, such as our society here in Norway, the easier it will be to prescribe an unacceptable level of damage on it. Russia believes that Western societies are more vulnerable to these types of pressure and Ukraine does not necessarily fit that same bill. This assumption that Russian strategists have about how Western societies would succumb to Russian demands if they cut power, water, or internet connectivity may well be wrong, and I think it is. We could again see a massive Russian intelligence failure in their predictions of how an adversary would react to their actions. But I still believe that if we want to be ready for how adversaries would try and exert pressure on our societies, then we must keep focusing on these threats. My last point relates to how any conflict with Russia will always have a nuclear dimension. Nuclear weapons remain the single most important security guarantee for Russia. At one point, President Putin has said that nuclear weapons comprise 90% of Russian security. This will not change. And it may well be that nuclear weapons become more important to Russia now that its conventional capabilities are taking a hit. Russian officials reiterate that Russia will not use nuclear weapons in Ukraine, but they also say that a war with NATO would quickly become very dangerous and imply basically the potential for nuclear escalation. The Swedish and Finnish accession to NATO will make Russia more paranoid about defending their nuclear assets that are located on the Kola Peninsula. Russia will take measures to enhance their disposition in the high north. They're already talking about reinforcing their western military district. Yep. The intensity of these Russian reinforcements may depend in part on Swedish and Finnish policies, but the basic point is obvious. Russia, excuse me, NATO expansion will make defending these vital interests more challenging for Russia. How do we think about or prepare for this nuclear dimension of a conflict with Russia? With prudent planning of operations against Russia, including through careful deliberation of targeting, with prudent planning and measures for our own defensive operations, with an enhanced focus on NATO channels of communication with Russia, and with a clearly conveyed willingness to respond to any type of aggression. Finally, with a consistent and systematic appreciation that if we do end up in a conflict with Russia, it will be with all of Russia and with the range of capabilities that they have displayed a willingness to use. But we will not be unprepared for that challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christine. And, and, and thank you all for your wonderful uh, discipline and time. That means we have some 30 minutes for debate now, which is, uh, I'm going to lead off. Um, look, I've been in this game several decades. Uh, the most overused phrases that I've heard at conferences like this are, we need to, 
and the word strategy. Uh, we bound them round and round and round. But what's the plan here? We even have heard different definitions of hybrid here that range from information warfare to cyber warfare or more limited to information confrontation. I like the concept very, very much. But now is the time to act, not talk. And there are some huge implications of what you've all said. To change society so that we have people protection and power projection on the scale that's implied in this morning's remarks, including that of General Christofferson, will require fundamental changes, huge investments across the civil military spectrum. Are we up to that challenge? Can we, as Odin implied, have freedom and security given the nature of the use of our open societies against us by totalitarian adversaries. I still don't get the sense, I don't believe we really grip our own rhetoric, our own analysis, and understand the implications that that analysis has for our society. Before I come back to the three of you, Ben, what are your reflections on what you've just heard about hybrid warfare and a defense of Europe, given that context? Well, I think part of our, um, the reason you have different definitions of hybrid is because we all have tried to put into a category what was happening, as yeah. if it was something separate. But I think this is Russian warfare, it's not hybrid warfare. I don't think that Russia wakes up in the morning thinking, we're at war, we're not at war. It's just the constant application of threats, leverage, disinformation, you know, whether it's grain, energy, uh, bribes, messing with underwater cables. And Odin, thanks for clarifying. I always thought the internet went through the air, but you, you educated me this morning. Um, it was, it's just constant. It's nonstop. It's, it's threats from, uh, the, uh, from the time of the Berlin blockade all of this. And so as soon as we finally wake up and realize they are at war all the time, it doesn't have to mean mushroom clouds on the horizon. But, but if, if we address that they're at war, you can still play hockey. You can still sort out fishing rights. You can still do stuff, but they're at war. Yeah. I mean, I had a conversation with the head of the, our UK GCHQ recently, uh, who used the phrase that we are under industrial levels of cyber attack every day in the UK, and I'm sure it's, it's the same here. I mean, Odin, give us your vision of what Norwegian society and security would look like in 2035, if it is to re be robust and resilient against the kind of array of threats that we've discussed here. I could probably talk till tomorrow about this, but I will try to get it into a few minutes. What we need to think about is that the society today is rather different from where we came during the last Cold War. Yeah. Uh, during the last Cold War, we had war and peace. Either it was peace or it was war. And if we declared war, the whole society adapted to it. Today, we need to have war and peace together. We need to have a total functioning civilian society if the military should work properly. Basically, because uh, we have uh, entered into uh, the globalism, to specialism, to all those things that uh, we need to create values. It's a value chain and not just a single point where you create all these stuffs you need. Before, the, sh the, the storage was in the shop. No, it's between the factory and the consumer. There, there ain't no storage facilities any longer. And if we should address that we need to change the world order, I don't think that. What I think we need to do is to, to manage risk. We cannot take away the liberties. I mean, if we take away the liberties, we are doing exactly what Mr. Putin wants us to do. So, so, so we need to be able to share information. We need to find new ways of working together. 
and be aware of that the capacities to do things is not within the governments anymore. It's within industry and businesses. And particularly when we address the big American or global uh, industries connected to information and so on and so forth. So uh, to get them on board, to share and to have this from the government side of the house who is actually running the whole thing, well, to find new ways of cooperate, cooperating, which we haven't invented yet, uh, but we will need to look into it if we should be able to actually do something in 2035. Thank you, Odi. Sophie, we, we, the paradox of this age is that we are funding the very adversaries who are attacking us. Because, let's be blunt, the West suffers from consumer obesity. Uh, we live in a, in a just-in-time world, but we're now moving back to a just-in-case security policy. Can just-in-time and just-in-case coexist? I think it's a difficult mix. Uh, to be in that space. I, I think we need to go towards a more risk-based approach. Just in time, will global uh, logistics will not support that, just from a, a consumer and demand point of view. So I, th I think we need to shift the policy towards a more risk-based approach like Wooden is addressing. And um, I just, uh, uh, GCHQ, you mentioned uh, Sir David Oman. Uh, I had David, a conversation yeah. with Sir David <laughs> Oman, and he mentioned slow-burning fires. And it really hit me because I think that's the picture of having slow burning fires. How, how can you have a policy that can, can tackle slow burning fi uh, uh, fires that might explode suddenly? It just sneaks up on you. And these, these issues we're talking about here is the slow burning fires that just suddenly hits you. And how to, how to build policy around the slow burning powers, uh, fires is, is, is the, 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 the big question here from my point of view. Um, next year, we will also give out holistic national security advice to the, to the parliament and the government. Um, so we're, we're, we're discussing this right now. Where should we be in the 2030 perspective in terms of development? And how quick must, must this policy be developed in order to, to, to meet the, the, the needs uh, that we and have? And what does the outcome of the policy look like in your mind? Well, at, at the moment, from a Norwegian perspective, we are, we are uh, recommending a lot of things recommending to be good at, you know, patching vulnerabilities and doing the greater things for a society. I need to, we need to shift from, from, from recommendations to, to, to really clear policies and, and requirements. And uh, we're discussing how to do that. In, in the US, you have the executive orders. You go quite far, both in the space domain, the cyberspace, in a, any other national security domains. Uh, and from a Norwegian um, perspective, I, I think we are in, in the midst of discussing how to do that shift, um, because we need to move faster. And that's, that's the key issue here. We're not, not moving fast enough in order to, to mitigate the threat. So we see the, the, the gap between the threats on one side and the security level on the other side to increase. And it's escalating now that we have also the war in, in Ukraine. And, and, and this is the difficult spot. And we want to use industry as a, as a real capacity, uh, just to pick up Udin's point. I think that's the monumental. If you look at the Ukraine now, they use Microsoft, they use Starlink, they use partnership with the US, they use all the, the, the capacities of industry. And, and this is how we should operate going further, to use the, the, the public and private strengths in order to, to mitigate threats with a great good policy uh, from, from a political point of view. Thank you, Sophie. I know that Norwegian politicians are absolutely brilliant and, um, and grip all this completely. When I'm addressing British politicians who are less brilliant, um, what I tend to do is I tell them what our security and defense architecture should look like in 2035, and they go, oh. And then we talk about how, how we go from here to there. So. I still want to drill down, perhaps you can help me, Kristin, with what that architecture would look like with that civil military spectrum of capabilities, capacities, and structures uh, that would make Norway more secure in 2035. 
Yeah, so this is uh, one of the questions that we are working on uh, within the context of the Norwegian uh, Defense Commission uh, as well that I'm mm. uh, a part of. Uh, but we haven't reached, we haven't drawn our final conclusions uh, yet with regard to that. But, but I wanted to point out that I think that with regard to dealing with this br broad spectrum of threats and dealing with hybrid th threats, I think that there is a need for us to to prioritize, because the whole, the whole concept of hybrid threats, it suffers from a lack of focus and a lack of prioritization. It basically broadens the range of threats that we de need to deal with to such a broad range uh, across the peace through war continuum that it becomes almost, uh, it becomes unattainable to try and mitigate these on a constant level uh, and, and, uh, and a, uh, a constant basis. So I think that uh, what we need to do is, is to basically delineate what types of threats and challenges we believe are the most damaging, uh, and then to, to home in on those, because the challenge, as, as Sophia points out as well, is, is just so, it's becoming so large that we need to basically make some tough choices, choices with regard to what to prioritize first, uh, in order to uh, mitigate the risks that are uh, the, the greatest ones that we face at this point in time. Uh, recognizing that we have uh, challenges across uh, a range of domains, but prioritizing the issues that we believe are the most important first. I think that's a, a very, I mean, this issue of threat perception, threat array across the hybrid cyber and hyper war spectrum there's a danger that, that everything becomes a priority and nothing is a priority. Mm -hmm. Because that we're simply, you know, that, that, you know, that criteria for making decisions. How the hell do you prioritize in such a broad array? Odin, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, because, I mean, uh, you cannot hide uh, behind uh, the complexity here. Uh, I mean, uh, the real problem with hybrid threats uh, in my opinion, is that, that you don't know that you are actually dealing with, with dynamite, playing with dynamite, before it's too late. You don't, you don't know that uh, the trade you are about to do is basically going to, to, to reveal the logistical chain of uh, Norway or NATO uh, to a party that should not have that, have access to that sort of information. So, so what, what we need to do is actually create a government, uh, private uh, sort of center that is capable of putting all the info together that is out there. It's easy to find if you take away the uh, sector principle or at least adjust it so that info can float up. You can build a broad picture and let the experts look into it and say, from different trades, look into it and say, hey, uh, this looks like a spooky trade, because we know the actor. We know who they are, and we know that it's completely impossible to find out who they really are, but they are connected to Russia. Yeah. We need to make that possible in joining forces and not sitting on each turf and say, in my sector, it looks perfectly well, uh, and forgetting that, that that isn't a problem any longer. It was maybe the problem during the Cold War, last Cold War. Now we need to forget that. Sectors are dangerous and very good, and we need to handle both. And that is really a dilemma. I mean, I, I, think, I think that's a very, very clear uh, analysis. It's not for me to advise Norway, but given where you're at, but I will. Um, <laughs> um, use your expert community to establish an analytical framework for understanding scale of threat so that you could then prioritize and then establish policy. Don't hold commissions with politicians to produce more blah, blah. What you've first got to have in complexity is an analytical framework that can turn that complexity into policy in which the greatest risk is focused on, not the marginal risk. 
Ben, I want to turn to you. Uh, we wrote, uh, published a book uh, both last year and this year, the German version, called Future War and the Defense of Europe, which is brilliant and, uh, and very reasonably priced. Um, and uh, um, we talked a lot about deterrence in the book. Now, I get the feeling that deterrence is stuck in a kind of 1970s time warp. We talk about conventional military deterrence, we talk about nuclear deterrence. But information warfare, cyber warfare, is part of the new continuum of escalation. Do we need to rethink deterrence in the face of hybrid cyber and, and future warfare? Well, I, I think that, uh, first of all, our political leaders have to understand and be able to articulate to their voters what the theory of deterrence actually means and, and why, why we have to invest in capabilities that we hope we will never need. I mean, you know, try to convince a teenager that they should wear a helmet, you know, or, or a, young, a young couple that they should buy insurance. It's like, you don't need it. It's never going to, I don't need it. So um, we can add up the cost of failed deterrence that's right in front of us. You know, we, we failed to deter Russia uh, from invading Ukraine, even though, and I thought General Christopherson did a good job of explaining the things that we attempted to do, it failed. So what's the cost? The cost of the war, the cost of refugees, millions of refugees, that the EU, even if it's, according to one French gentleman, there's 20 years before Ukraine can join the EU, the EU is going to have to join Ukraine immediately. And it's going to cost billions of euro because uh, you have to rebuild Ukraine for, for people to be able to go back home. Uh, what's the cost of this uh, of grain uh, embargo? That hundreds of millions of people are going to go hungry in unstable governments, which is going to put more refugees on the road to Europe. This is not an accident. The Kremlin knows exactly that this is a, a weaponization of food to generate more refugees to destabilize Europe. So you can start adding up these costs, and we're in the trillions of euro, and um, and then compare that to if we would have invested more in the necessary defenses and also the policy to deter Russia, the, the disparity is going to be remarkable, that we would have saved so much money in the long run if we'd have been prepared. Now, where our great alliance has fallen short, and I hope it will be discussed in, uh, in Madrid and in the new strategic concept, is just we're all being affected by something that happened literally across the border from NATO, across the border from EU. So... Russia knows how much we value the unity of the alliance, and they also know how terrified some of our leaders are about the possibility of escalation, that they almost, that we've deterred ourselves, and they've been given free reign to do whatever the hell they wanted. I mean, that's, that's exactly what has happened. So we've got to figure out how do we deter them from launching cyber strikes. I mean, they've got to know that the U.S. and U.K. have offensive cyber capability that can wipe them out. We have to demonstrate that we're willing to do that. So it does boil down to not only investment and capability, but policy. Do we have the right policies in place? And that's the hard part, to uh, have policies that allow use of cyber in an offensive way. Uh, use of artificial intelligence. I mean, I live in Frankfurt, Germany. They are very uneasy about how artificial intelligence and un autonomous systems are used. So we have to get the policies right for that, too. Absolutely right, Ben. I think you did. And it, but it's gripping that future. And in the remaining five minutes, 58 seconds that we have, the next panel is politicians. So this panel in reverse order, what is your message to them? And be brave. Don't tell them what you think they want to hear. Tell them what you think they need to hear. Starting with Christian first. Because I do. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I think um, I'm preoccupied with um, the, the power, concerned about the patterns of interaction that are now being established in Europe, the security dynamics that are being established in Europe and how that will determine basically our future for the next decades. 
So, so um, my advice would be to, to take the long-term view into consideration when we now formulate or change our own security and defense policies to make sure that there is a certain level of flexibility instilled in those policies and choices that we make in order to accommodate some type of um, coexistence uh, with uh, Russia, uh, NATO's potential adversary, but NATO's inevitable neighbor. Um, I think that it's important to keep that perspective in mind as well during these very difficult times when it is extremely difficult and politically uh, not very easy to sell um, an argument about how this is, this is an, a potential adversary that we basically need to share a continent with. Spoken like a politician. <laughs> <laughs> Sophie. It's very easy for our leadership to think about tanks and home guard and physical capabilities when we're starting to discuss the future. Something that's tangible. You can smell it, you can see it. It's tangible, you can understand what it is. Um, the virtual world, that is mostly my slow-burning fire domain, uh, is difficult to, to grasp, and, and the leadership needs to see that this is maybe where the spillover effect towards Norwegian assets will be in this area. And we are based on a sectorial, very sectorial structure, and my, my dream would be that we elevate the discussion across these sectorial uh, boundaries. That's where we can actually address the hybrid threats. That's the only way to, to address it. Civilian military, that's the one division we, we need to, to build down. We need to look this across oil and gas, power, telecommunications, and so forth. And lastly, I think geopolitically, our oil and gas will be high on the target list and is of great concern of a national risk. I'm just very blunt, you, you challenge me. Yeah, go, go, go. <laughs> our, yeah. our oil and gas can be used uh, towards the UK in terms of our gas supplies. And I think uh, prioritizing the robustness around our oil and gas, also the maritime and the shipment and the pipelines will be where we will be tested. Thank you. Well, as a, as a Yorkshireman, I can tell you there's huge amounts of shale gas under Lancashire. And the idea of digging up Lancashire has always been very attractive to me. But uh, <laughs> Odin, in a minute or so, sir, what's your message to our political masters? Are we asking all the questions? Are we really uh, daring to lift all the difficult questions concerning freedom of navigation? Uh, is it wise to let a sur that survey vessel do what they ask to do? And if no, uh, well, tell no. Uh, I think we should be very careful in, say in, in saying we have to do this and we have to do that because of uh, the complications involved in what we are actually doing. So in order to get the right answers, it needs to be teamwork uh, from the very local level and up to the global level. And we need to seek together uh, like-minded nation who l would like to defend the freedoms and democracies in order to find good, good solutions. And for Norway, to be very, very blunt, uh, well, I'm educated in Sweden. I lived in Sweden for, for two years in Stockholm, and I've learned the Swedes to know quite well. And I am very impressed of Sweden in many ways, and they have, lift, they have dared to lift the question about NATO membership. So has Finland. It is time that we dare to lift the question about EU membership. Norway is very, very vulnerable standing alone out there, and EU, EU and NATO is some sort of working together on this. We have to, we have to acknowledge that what actually has effect on Russia right now is not NATO, it's EU yeah. and the sanctions. 
So we need to be part, we need to be at the table where the decisions are made and not standing outside. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you all. Time is up. But let me, let me conclude with this one point. We must have the ambition to shape the future and not simply be a reactive victim to it. Politicians, over to you. Let me thank Odin, Kristin, Sophie, Ben. Great panel, guys. Thank you very much.